We think quantum computers will allow us to solve some problems faster than we can with classical computers alone. But understanding how is subtle. Today, in Kiskit in the Classroom, we'll try to uncover the source of the power of quantum computing by looking at one of the very first algorithms. Welcome to Kiskit in the Classroom. In this series, we'll use Kiskit to explore some fundamental concepts commonly covered in quantum computing related courses. Each video is accompanied by an interactive module linked in the description below, so be sure to check that out. If you've heard much about quantum computers, you've probably heard that they can use quantum phenomena like superposition, entanglement, and interference to solve problems in ways classical computers can't. But how exactly do these features help? In 1985, David Deutsch was the first to show how this could happen. He came up with what is now called Deutsch's algorithm that could solve a problem more efficiently than a classical algorithm could. Today, we'll take a look at Deutsch's algorithm and a later extension called the Deutsch-Josa algorithm and examine how the uniquely quantum aspects of the qubits can be used to the quantum computer's benefit. Then we'll run these algorithms on a real quantum computer with Qiskit. There are other quantum algorithms out there that also show a theoretical advantage over known classical algorithms, and not all of them work with the same principles as those we'll see today. So what we'll learn today doesn't explain in general how a quantum computer works, but it does help us begin to see how the principles of quantum mechanics can be combined to make a powerful quantum computer. Before diving into Deutsch's algorithm, let's first think about how quantum computers are different from classical computers and how that might give us an advantage in solving certain problems. One difference is that the quantum bits, called qubits, can be in superposition states. Instead of being limited to either the zero state or the one state, as a classical bit is, a qubit can be in a superposition state of both zero and one. We write this state like this, where A and B are complex numbers whose squares add up to one, and the more qubits, the more this gap extends. Two bits can still be in only one of these four possible states. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. Two qubits can be in a superposition of all four of those classically allowed states, which is written like this. In general, a classical system of n bits can only ever be in just one of two to the n possible combinations of zeros and ones. A quantum system of n qubits can be in a superposition of all two to the n of these states. The scaling is exponential. So even if we had just 10 qubits, they could be in a superposition state of 2 to the 10, which is 1,024 possible combinations of zeros and ones. The exponential scaling of the state space of qubits is called quantum parallelism and is partially responsible for the advantage of quantum computers over classical computers. But a quantum computer is not just a massive parallel processor. Just because the qubits in a quantum computer can be in a superposition of exponentially many states doesn't mean we have access to all the information in each of these states, since measurement collapses the system into one state or another. Let's see how this plays out in a simple problem. Say there's some machine that you could feed a single bit to, then it will apply some function to the bit and spit out another single bit. The machine is inside a black box that we can't access. All we have access to is the bit we feed it, x, and the bit that the box spits out, f of x. We want to figure out what is the function f that the machine is applying. There are four possible functions that take a single bit to another single bit. So to find out what the function is, we can just feed it a zero and see if it spits out a zero or a one, then feed it a one and do the same thing. Each of these two steps is called a query. This is one way to compare classical and quantum algorithms through the so-called query model, 
where we compare the number of queries each of the algorithms need to make of the black box in order to solve the problem. So in this case, our classical method needed to query the box twice to learn the function. Let's see if we can do better if we have a quantum computer query the black box. Instead of first feeding a zero and then a one, the quantum computer can feed the box a qubit that's in a superposition of zero and one. So in effect, we're feeding the box both inputs with a single query. Then does that mean that we can learn the function with only one query? Unfortunately, that's not the case. We see why this idea fails when we test it on a quantum computer. We'll make a circuit with two qubits. Qubit zero, represented here by this top line, will be our input state, x, that we feed to the black box, which was shown here by the maroon gate labeled uf. The uf gate is designed to take a qubit zero as the input state, x, then apply a transformation on qubit one that takes the state zero to the state f of x. So as long as qubit one started in the state zero, then the output is x on qubit zero and f of x on qubit one. So to find f of x for both x equals zero and x equals one simultaneously, we can try putting qubit zero in a superposition of zero and one before we feed it to the black box. That's done with this red Hadamard gate, which transforms the zero state to one over root two, zero plus one. So after the black box gate, we should now have a superposition of both f of zero and f of one on qubit one. When we measure the two qubits, we're hoping to answer the question, what function is inside the black box? Let's use the Qiskit primitive sampler to run the circuit and return the result. We can choose the number of times the circuit is run, called samples, by changing this parameter called shots here. This is equivalent to the number of queries we make of the black box. Let's see if just one query will work. Here's the result. We measured qubit zero to be zero, so that was the input value, x, and qubit one to be one, which was the output value, f of x. So now we know f of zero equals one. But what about f of one? Here's where the problem lies. Once we measured the state, the superpositions collapsed, and we only got to measure one part of the function with a single query. This doesn't tell us everything we need to know to determine which function it is. We would need a second query of the box for that. So even though the principle of quantum parallelism allows us to simultaneously have the black box evaluate f of zero and f of one, we don't have access to both of those answers. Quantum parallelism alone is not enough. Deutsch's algorithm shows how we can use quantum parallelism a little differently to learn about the function inside the black box. We won't be able to learn exactly what the function is, but we will be able to learn something new about it with a single query that we couldn't with a classical computer. Let's start by looking at a chart of the four possible functions, taking a single bit to another single bit. Here, you can see that two of the functions, f1, and f4 always return a single value, regardless of the input state. We call these two functions constant. f2 and f3 will return either zero or one, depending on the state of x. We call these two functions balanced. Deutsch's algorithm determines if the function is constant or balanced by making some clever adjustments to the circuit we used before. Here's the circuit. It starts by preparing qubit zero in the state one over square root two, zero plus one, with a Hadamard as before, and qubit one in the state one over square root two, zero minus one, with a not gate followed by a Hadamard. So the full state at this point here is where this is the state of qubit zero, and this is the state of qubit one. Preparing qubit one in such a way, rather than just leaving it in the state zero, 
enables the algorithm to use quantum parallelism in combination with interference to learn about the black box function. Let's see how. When the qubits are fed into UF, the black box gate, a couple things can happen. If the function is constant, then the black box will perform some operation on qubit 1 alone, regardless of the state of 0. In this case, since UF doesn't touch qubit 0 or care about its state at all, then the second Hadamard here just undoes what the first Hadamard did and will measure the qubit to be in the state 0. Let's look at the balanced function F2 as an example to see what UF does to the state in this case. When x is 0, f of x is 0, and when x is 1, f of x is 1. Remember what I told you about the uf gate. It takes qubit 0 as our input x state and outputs f of x on qubit 1, assuming that qubit 1 started in the 0 state. So for this function, what uf does to qubit 1 depends on qubit 0. If 0 is 0, then qubit 1 will be left in the 0 state to get f of x equals 0. If qubit 0 is 1, the black box will apply a NOT gate to qubit 1 and put it in the state 1, so we get f of 1 equals 1. This is exactly what a controlled NOT or a C NOT gate does. A C NOT gate takes two qubits, a control qubit and a target qubit, and flips the state of the target qubit if the control qubit is in the state 1 but it does nothing to the target if the control qubit is in the state 0. So uf for f2 is just a c0 on q0 and q1. The c0 gate will do nothing to the first term since the control qubit is in the state 0, but on the second term, this 0 flips to 1 and this 1 flips to 0, and if we factor out a minus sign, we'll see that the state of qubit 1 is unchanged but this term has picked up a minus sign. So the state of qubit 0 is actually the one that has changed. It went from being 0 plus 1 to being 0 minus 1. When we apply the final Hadamard to qubit 0, this transforms it to the state 1. So if the function in the black box is f2, we'll measure a 1 instead of a 0. It turns out that the uf gate for the other balance function, f3, is the same C0 gate followed by a not on qubit 1. That final not gate doesn't affect qubit 0, so when the function is balanced, we'll measure qubit 0 to be in the 1 state at the end of the circuit. Now, if you didn't follow all of this, that's all right. I suggest you go through it on your own to see how it works. The major point here is what happened when we applied the C0 for the two balanced functions. Qubit 0 was only used as a control qubit to change the state of qubit 1. Intuitively, you might think that qubit 0 would remain unchanged, and yet somehow our operations on qubit 1 actually change the state of qubit 0 by changing the relative phase between the two parts of its superposition. This phenomenon is known as the phase kickback mechanism, and it's super counterintuitive, like a lot of quantum phenomena. In a way, you can think of the phase kickback mechanism like rowing a boat. The act of pushing water backwards actually propels you forward, just like the operations on qubit 1 actually change qubit 0. Now we can run Deutsch's algorithm on Qiskit. Here we can select which function to put inside the black box, which we've chosen to be F3. Here's the circuit diagram of the algorithm and we can run it as before with the sampler primitive. We'll set the number of samples to just one and see what we measure. In this case, we measured one, so we know that the function was balanced, which is indeed what we expected since the black box contained the function f3. So, with just a single query, we were able to differentiate between these two classes of functions. This would have taken a classical algorithm two queries to determine. This shows a modest advantage of quantum computing over classical computing alone, but it's not too impressive, just one versus two. But Deutsch's algorithm is still extremely important to the history of quantum computing because it provided the spark that got others thinking about larger, more sophisticated quantum algorithms. 
This includes a multi-qubit extension of Deutsch's algorithm that demonstrates a much more impressive quantum advantage. This is called the Deutsch-Josa algorithm. It solves a similar problem, but in this case, the black box function that we want to learn about takes n bits as an input and outputs a single bit. As before, we're promised that the function is either constant, meaning the output bit is always 1 or always 0, regardless of the input bit string, or balanced, meaning the output is 0 for half of the input bit strings and 1 for the other half. There are, of course, other functions that take n bits to a single bit that are neither constant nor balanced. But in this problem, we're promised that none of those functions are inside the black box. The one in the box is guaranteed to be either constant or balanced. The deutsch josa circuit looks similar to Deutsch's algorithm, but with more qubits. Here we have an implementation of the deutsch josa algorithm to learn about a three-bit function. This time, we have three qubits for the input state rather than just the one. And then we have this last qubit for the output state as before. Again, we prepare all the input qubits to be in the state zero plus one and the output qubit to be in the state zero minus one. Then, although the math is a little more complicated to follow, the principle remains the same. If the function is constant, it will not depend on the top three qubits at all. So their states will transform back to zero after the second Hadamards, and our measurement will yield a three-bit string of all zeros. But if the function is balanced, then when we measure the qubits following the Hadamards, the phase kickback mechanism will cause one or more of those bits to be one. That might not be so easy to see this time, but if you work through each step yourself, you'll soon see this must be the case. One way to check this is to try to calculate the probability of measuring all zeros with a balanced function. You should get a probability of zero. Let's run the Deutsch-Josa algorithm on a quantum computer with Qiskit. The toughest step is probably creating the Deutsch-Josa function that will be our black box that we query. Here, this code produces a random Deutsch-Josa function that is guaranteed to be either balanced or constant. Then we make our Deutsch-Josa circuit, inserting our black box function here. Again, we run the circuit with sampler, and after we measure, we look at the measured bits to determine whether the function was balanced or constant. If they're all zero, it's constant. But if there's at least one one bit in the string, then it's balanced. In this case, we get a bit string of one, one, one. So we know that the function was balanced. I hope I've given you your first glimpse at how quantum algorithms can take advantage of interesting and often subtle quantum phenomena to obtain their advantage over classical algorithms. You've probably also picked up on how tricky it can be to design quantum algorithms. Even the very first one required a lot of creativity to achieve just a modest win over classical methods. And since that first algorithm, Physicists and computer scientists have continued to come up with incredibly inventive ways to use quantum mechanics to their advantage, including further extensions and applications of the Deutsch-Josa algorithm. If you want to learn about some of these, as well as try out the Deutsch and Deutsch-Josa algorithms for yourself, head over to the module linked in the description to get started. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.